in the center. Thank you. Um, I had a question on the cyber weapon issue. Would you say then that uh, having a cyber weapon is uh, less harmful than having a bomb? Uh, is it the idea that uh, bombing a server would be um, more da dangerous uh, than, say, taking down a web page? Thank you. So using cyber capabilities may be a more proportionate response response, and that's the reason why I welcome that we are now integrating national cyber capabilities into NATO missions and uh, operations, and that we have agreed the principles of uh, doing that. Um, um, for NATO, uh, it is always the aim to uh, use uh, minimum force to achieve maximum effect, and therefore uh, cyber effects may be the best response. That depends very much on the situation, but we have seen that NATO allies have been uh, using cyber um, uh, capabilities against ISIS uh, in Iraq and Syria, and that has been important uh, in the fight against uh, ISIS. Uh, and uh, uh, I strongly believe that uh, in uh, any military conflict, cyber will be an integrated uh, part and therefore we need to strengthen our cyber uh, uh, defenses and our cyber capabilities. Um, uh, we will integrate national cyber capabilities into NATO missions and operations as we integrate their uh, conventional capabilities, being it uh, ships, tanks, planes. Uh, it will still be under full national control. Uh, it will be national capabilities, but they will be integrated into NATO missions and operations. Let me also add that uh, we have, as part of our uh, strengthening of our cyber uh, defenses, we have also decided to uh, establish, or we have established cyber as a military domain, and we have also decided that cyber attacks can trigger Article 5. So, uh, integrating national cyber effects into NATO missions and operations is yet another step uh, to strengthen uh, cyber uh, in NATO. Washington Post. Hi, Michael Birnbaum from the Washington Post. Um, another question about cyber. Um, do you foresee a role for cyber effects to be uh, used in the defensive operations uh, related to the EFP deployment or in general in that area of NATO in the Baltics and Poland? Is, and is that something that you would announce publicly if they were to have a role that they haven't had previously. Thank you. NATO is a defensive, is a, is a defensive alliance, and what we do is always uh, proportionate. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, always according to international law, uh, and uh, uh, we are now integrating uh, cyber effects into NATO missions and operations to uh, respond to a changed and a new security environment where cyber is part of the threat picture we have to respond to. I will not speculate exactly when and how we are going to use it. Uh, I will only on underline that uh, it will be um, uh, also in accordance with international law. It will be uh, uh, national owned and controlled uh, capabilities. Uh, and uh, and uh, it will be a way to respond uh, in ways that can um, um, be more proportionate than when we are uh, forced to only use conventional forces. Uh, but I think it will only be wrong if I start to speculate exactly on how and where. I can just refer to that NATO allies have used it uh, uh, against ISIS uh, in a very uh, effective way. Lady in green over there. Secretary General, thank you. Um, the Turkish Minister of Defense has signed a letter of intent today with his um, French and Italian colleagues. Uh, this project is about uh, acquiring um, air to um, ground to air missile uh, systems. Uh, given that Turkey has created some unease or questions within the alliance when announcing the project to acquire S-400 uh, missile systems from Russia. I was wondering how you would see this step towards 
a real contract. Thank you. So I welcome very much the cooperation between uh, Turkey, uh, France and Italy uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, developing um, air defense uh, systems. Uh, we welcome always when NATO allies are working together uh, to develop uh, different capabilities. And um, uh, I think that um, this kind of cooperation uh, is the best way also to make sure that we have uh, the capabilities different nations need. And it's also a good way to make sure that when we have new capabilities, they can be fully integrated into uh, NATO uh, uh, air defense uh, systems. Um, for NATO, it's extremely important to have interoperability. And of course, uh, having uh, three NATO allies working together, uh, that uh, is an example of how we really develop interoperability, how nations can work together. Uh, so, yeah, so I welcome that. Okay, uh, gentlemen over there. Thank you, Konstantin Benimov from Medusa. Uh, have you decided on the location for the Coordination Center for Cybersecurity? And if yes, are there going to be specific NATO forces involved in working or just uh, the capabilities of um, NATO members? Um, the center is part of the existing command uh, structure, uh, uh, but uh, to be honest, I'm not able to tell you exactly where it's going to be located, but it's part of the existing command structure. James, front row here. Uh, yes, Brooke Signer, Jane's Defense. Uh, coming back to this um, logistics aspect of the, the reformed uh, NATO command structure, I was just wondering, could you explain to us in more detail what this will mean? NATO already has a number of agencies that are intimately involved in logistics management, as you well know. Uh, so are you referring to simply closer relationship with the EU to tackle these things, or do you have something more substantial in mind uh, in, uh, internal to the House of NATO? Thank you. This is about uh, updating, um, uh, modernizing the military requirements to infrastructure, taking into account the fact that we are now much more focused on uh, the importance of moving heavy equipment across Europe. Uh, for, because uh, after the end of the Cold War, uh, we didn't pay so much attention to that. Uh, the main issue was how to move uh, lighter forces into expeditionary operations outside NATO territory, for instance, to Afghanistan. But now it is about how to move forces across the Atlantic and how to move them across uh, Europe. And, and we speak also about much heavier equipment, battle tanks, armored uh, vehicles, and that kind of uh, equipment. Uh, to be able to do that, uh, we uh, need infrastructure. And we know that we, uh, at least in, in many parts of Europe, we don't have the standards, we don't have the strength of the bridges or the roads or the different uh, types of infrastructure which can carry the heavy equipment we need to uh, move. At least not enough. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and it's about uh, making sure that we have the means of transportation, the ships, the trucks, uh, the planes, and to a large extent, these uh, means of transportation will be privately owned. So we need to make arrangements with uh, uh, private uh, companies uh, on how to make these uh, tools available if needed. It's about legislation. And of course, it's about uh, making sure that NATO allies implement those standards and those requirements. We formulate the requirements and the standards, but of course, it's nations that have to implement them when they invest in infrastructure, when they make arrangements with, for instance, uh, private uh, providers of uh, uh, transportation. Uh, uh, the European Union is important, and I welcome the very close cooperation with the European Union on, uh, on this, and I know that this is also something which the European Union has been focused on, uh, because this is partly about uh, also uh, European Union financing some of these investments. So, so this, this is... We have the ability to move forces today, but we would like to move more forces more quickly across Europe, and then we have to invest more in infrastructure uh, and, 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 and to meet modern NATO standards. Wall Street General. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, um, the U.S. raised uh, the INF treaty violations today. 
Was there uh, new information about Russian uh, violations of this treaty raised? What was the significance of the U.S. bringing this to discussion at the NATO ministerial level? And what is the importance in your mind of keeping the INF treaty uh, uh, in place? Secretary Mattis uh, briefed uh, uh, the allies uh, on the INF uh, uh, treaty. And uh, the U.S. has determined that Russia is in violation of the INF uh, treaty. Um, so uh, uh, that was uh, uh, an important message in his uh, brief. Um, NATO allies uh, stressed, just as they uh, did at the Warsaw uh, summit in 2016, uh, that, um, as, uh, that the INF treaty is very important and that a strong uh, uh, and viable uh, INF uh, treaty is a pillar for European uh, security. Um, uh, so they also expressed that they will follow this very closely. This is a bilateral agreement between Russia and the United States, but of course it has a great importance for all NATO allies, especially European NATO allies, uh, because the INF treaty um, uh, eliminate a whole category of uh, weapons, uh, intermediate uh, uh, range in, uh, missiles, uh, uh, which can carry nuclear uh, weapons. And I am uh, part of a political generation in Europe which really grew up with the very intense debate related to the deployment of the SS-20s and the uh, uh, Pershing and the, um, and the cruise missiles after the dual track decision of NATO in 1979. And we also very much welcomed the INF Treaty, which then uh, eliminated all these weapons uh, 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 in Europe. So I think that um, the INF Treaty is a cornerstone. It's extremely important that uh, it is uh, uh, fully uh, implemented. Uh, so uh, we will continue to call on Russia to address the serious uh, concerns in a substantial, transparent, and verifiable uh, way because the INF Treaty is so important for uh, all of us. Uh, Europa Press. Uh, thank you, Secretary General. Going back to cyber, um, did any of the Allies today offer offensive uh, cyber capabilities for NATO uh, missions and operations? And also, I'm wondering, is this going to be, if it already isn't, fit it into the NATO defense planning process? I mean, are the Allies going to start getting from now on specific capability uh, requests for uh, cyber offensive capabilities? Thank you. So what we have done today is to agree the framework and the principles for how to integrate cyber capabilities into NATO missions and operations. Uh, then uh, it will be uh, a decision by nations uh, what kind of capabilities they are willing to integrate and to use in specific missions and operations, and the nation will, uh, nations will retain full control and ownership to the uh, capabilities. But I welcome the fact that we now can strengthen NATO missions and operations also with uh, uh, cyber capabilities, because we know that they are important, uh, and we know that uh, cyber will be an integral part of any uh, potential military uh, uh, conflict. Uh, it's too early for me to say anything exactly how we will integrate that into NATO planning processes, but as soon as this is becoming a part of NATO missions and operations, we have to integrate it in one way or another in the way we plan for missions and, uh, and operations. Uh, and uh, and the, this is just illustrating that we are, we are adapting to a new world where cyber is becoming more and more important, uh, uh, but it's not that different than, for instance, conventional, uh, 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 also capabilities, where nations have the ownership, uh, but they use them in a NATO uh, mission on, and the operation. And regardless of whether we speak about a plane or a tank or a cyber capability, uh, the use of these capabilities uh, uh, is going to be uh, in accordance with the international law and is going to be part of the defensive uh, posture of uh, NATO. Gentlemen over there. Hello, Wasim Ibrahim from Al Etihad newspaper, Lebanese newspaper. Secretary General, you discussed the global challenges today. 
And uh, you said something before about that ISIS now has, uh, there is more risk that ISIS will focus on attacking uh, partners or even uh, alliance uh, countries. Can you explain, depending on what exactly you are building this uh, assessment, and are you worried that this fight against ISIS will become also endless uh, war, like oh, we see what's happening in Afghanistan? Thank you. I think we have to be prepared that uh, the fight against ISIS uh, is a generational fight, that will, it will take time. It is an important achievement that we are now very close to totally eradicating the caliphate, the, the territory they controlled uh, in, uh, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, but ISIS or, kind of, or, or some kind of uh, so follow-up uh, of ISIL uh, we'll, uh, we have to be prepared that that will, uh, may still be a threat to uh, NATO allies and many other people in other countries. Uh, and we have seen before that terrorist organizations, when they uh, lose uh, uh, at one front, they uh, start to do uh, aggressive actions uh, in another area. We have seen that in Afghanistan, for instance, uh, I think the last couple of weeks and months, where Taliban and the insurgents uh, have not been able to gain their main strategic goal to control provincial uh, capitals. And then we have seen more high-profile terrorist attacks against civilians. So, of course, nothing is certain. This is an unpredictable uh, challenge and threat. But I'm just saying that we have to be prepared. And I don't think uh, uh, the, the, we have the final uh, uh, victory over ISIL, uh, even though it is a very important step that we have been able to uh, so to get them out of the territories they controlled in Iraq and Syria. Okay, one uh, question over there, that's AP. Associated Press on, on the other side here. A, a lot of what the ministers have discussed, whether it's command, mobility and so on, um, has been in reference to Russia, although you've not really mentioned it. Could, could you give us an assessment of, of uh, the threat the risk that you think Russia poses right now? In terms of Zapad, you said that the personnel had left. Was any equipment left? Is there anything that leads you to think that Russia poses a greater threat today than it has uh, over the last years? NATO's deter uh, deterrence and defense is not directed against any uh, specific uh, uh, nation. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't see any imminent threat against any NATO ally. And uh, uh, we have monitored and followed the support exercise very closely. Uh, but we haven't seen that they have, uh, for instance, uh, left or, or, or uh, remained with troops or, or equipment, for instance, in Belarus, uh, as, as we saw some speculations about before the exercise. Having said that, uh, we have seen a much more assertive Russia. Uh, we have seen a Russia which has, over many years, invested heavily in uh, their military capabilities, modernize their military capabilities, uh, which are exercising not only conventional forces, but also nuclear forces, and which has been willing to use military force against the neighbor, Ukraine. Uh, and of course, NATO has to be able to respond to that, and we have responded to that, partly with our enhanced force presence, with more deployment of troops in the eastern part of the lines, but also by increasing the readiness of our forces and also increasing our ability to move forces. And we are uh, con constantly adapting, and uh, what we do in Europe now is part of that ad adaptation. Spiegel. Secretary Darrell, one question um, also about the fight against ISIS. There has been an announcement more or less about a possible cap 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 oh, Jesus like a mission in Iraq to stabilize the Iraqi army, and there has been a fact-finding mission, as far as I know, in February. What are the results of this um, fact-finding, and is there any, is this mission in itself moving forward, and will it be discussed tomorrow at the, at the meeting after the formal uh, NATO meeting? I expect it will be discussed tomorrow. It was also discussed uh, today, uh, and NATO has already started the training activities in Iraq. Uh, we were asked by uh, Prime Minister Al-Badi, I met him, he sent a letter and he asked for NATO uh, support for uh, training and capacity building in Iraq of Iraqi government uh, forces. Uh, so that's something we have already started. It's, it's, uh, 
it's uh, still uh, not so big. It's, a, it's, a, it's some training activities uh, related to, for instance, a counter IED. Um, uh, it's uh, helping them with maintenance of equipment. Uh, it's uh, military medicine. Uh, and it's also helping them to build uh, security and defense uh, institutions uh, and in some other areas. So we are doing some training activities uh, based on requests from the Iraqi government. What we are now discussing is whether we should scale that up. And again, this is not about NATO going into any combat role or combat mission in Iraq, but it is about the fact that we have to be able to make sure that Iraq is stable after ISIS is defeated. Uh, uh, and therefore we need uh, competent, uh, capable, well-trained Iraqi forces uh, to make sure that uh, we are not forced back again uh, into combat missions or operations in, in, uh, in Iraq. So training local forces is the, one of the best weapons we have against terrorists. Uh, and uh, I strongly believe that NATO can do more uh, when it comes to training and capacity building. Because if our neighbors are more stable, we are more secure. And uh, uh, one of the best weapons in fighting terrorism. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. Thank you.